programs that encompass both our social safety net and then support for our rural communities are essential. One thing that we have to guard and protect against <coughs> as federal representatives is creating unfunded mandates for local governments to try to deal with. And I think that while I am working very hard to make sure that I'm clear that we are trying to make opportunities for people, create jobs that pay a living wage. However we take care of our most vulnerable, po vulnerable populations at their most vulnerable times is a real uh, testament to who we are as a society. And I think it's very important that things like SNAP and temporary assistance for needy families are protected and funded because not only do they help people in times of need and provide that bridge to get them from maybe a time of employment to a challenging time and then getting back to employment, but it also provides a funding source for local communities. That money is spent in our community at our local businesses. It's not like it's a zero-sum game and doesn't add to our own economy. So I think I just want to be clear about that. The other thing is, we need to make sure that the federal government is fully funding programs that help rural communities. So for example, we all know that in Mammoth, we struggle with having enough affordable housing for our workforce. We have incredible people in the community who are working really hard <coughs> to try to solve that problem on the local level. The job, in my opinion, of the representative is to make sure that the federal government is funding those programs fully so that we can implement the work that our local governments have have created. So that's my thought. Very good. Thank you, Chris. Let's go to Jay. Oh, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> I got too involved in what you're saying. <laughs> Talk about Oh yes, okay, social safety net. Social uh, okay. Stamp. Got it. Okay, and uh, the impact it has in our community. Sure. And how do you prioritize those when it comes to budget time that it, it maximizes the impact it has for us in a positive manner? Right. So I can say categorically there has never been a time when the programs that we're talking about were more important to the people of the United States, but particularly the people of rural California. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that poverty is a problem, but it's mostly a problem in big cities. You know, like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Las Vegas, you know, we don't have poverty here in Inyo and Mono counties. We don't have poverty in Mammoth, but you know and I know that that's absolutely untrue. We're seeing homelessness and uh, food instability in places in California that we have never seen them before. We have homelessness here. We have homelessness where I live in Big Bear. If you want to see deep poverty, you don't have to go anywhere further than Victorville. Go to downtown Victorville, drive through there, and you'll see what people really struggle and look like. So it is critical that you elect somebody that can go to Washington, D.C. and articulate those points uh, to the people who are distributing this funding because we need it just as badly as the, the urban areas of the United States and we struggle to get appropriate funding because oftentimes the urban areas gobble it all up. So we need to make sure we articulate that difference. But I want to talk about something else and it's another way that we are really suffering right now. Uh, it's the problem of mental health. Right now, basically, both the federal government and the state of California have punted this issue and have said to the counties, okay, counties, it's your problem, and you know what? Shame on you for not doing a better job. And the counties, I mean, they have no funding to do this. They're already struggling to meet the workload uh, of the residents that already depend on them. Okay, and we all know that, home, that mental health is one of the key underpinnings of the problems of, uh, of homelessness and of poverty. So uh, we, we have to solve this issue. Uh, really, the state got out of the mental health services business altogether uh, a decade ago when we closed the last of the state mental health hospitals. You know, and the state really hasn't provided any substantial funding since then, and neither has the federal government. It is critical that we solve that problem in the next few years, because I believe that we are at an inflection point, kind of a, a tipping point, and if we don't get the problem of mental health and our societal responsibility for providing it under control in the next few years, I think that the problem is going to get exponentially worse. Thank you, sir. Tim, bring it home. Yeah, so I, I'm going to take this in a different direction. Uh, my goal will not be to expand funding for programs. My goal will be to expand jobs and get people off of programs so that they're not dependent on the government. 
uh, which can be very unreliable. Um, and in particular, um, talking about what, uh, what Chris mentioned about the affordable housing up here, that I, uh, my wife and I went into the uh, Bass Outlet to buy some boots while we were up here, because uh, we heard there was going to be snow, right? And, um, and there were two ladies in line, and I wound up talking to them, and they turned out to be Republican voters, and they told me that one of the biggest problems was housing for people who work here, that they're, they're sleeping in their cars in this kind of weather. And we had trouble in a cabin that had a heater, uh, and we were cold, so I can't even imagine. And I, I don't know that the government is the right way to try to solve this. I, I think we've got to be a little more pragmatic and, I, and I've heard talk uh, and, and discuss the issue with a number of people up here. And one of the ideas that you guys are working on right now, regardless of whoever you elect, is putting an airport in Bishop. Well, if you're going to build an airport or expand the airport, well, there's a place where you could build some housing. You could build some other facilities. You know, one of the biggest hang-ups seems to me that the federal government owns too much of the land. And if they own too much of the land, then the private land that's left becomes too dear and too expensive. And, and so, therefore, the cost of whatever you do has to, ultimately, you, you, can't, you can't have a piece of property that could make you a tremendous amount of money and pay all the taxes uh, and then say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lease it out to somebody making a minimum wage. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, doesn't make any economic sense anyway. So I think I think we have to be thinking a little bit more along the lines of, of what opportunities could come along with that airport. And I don't even know what you guys think of it, but I think it certainly has a lot of promise. Um, and and ultimately, it has the ability to maybe alleviate in the short term a huge problem. People sleeping in their cars shouldn't be happening. There's a need for short-term or temporary or you want to call it affordable housing. Um, that that might be the, that might be the way. Just a thought. Tim, thank you. Let's go to our next subject: public land management. We really want to talk about what is the impact to have on our district, our community. Okay, both our counties, as was alluded to by Chris, 90% of our land is federal public lands. The financial stability of our communities are driven by recreation. We're devastated by forest fires. How do you, how do you assist us with prioritizing management policies to fully fund or increase funding for the Forest Service, for other local municipalities, to help support recreation, to help support our thriving economy? Because we are driven by recreation. What does that look like? What does it taste like? What is the impact that that lack of funding has on our community at this point? And how do you prioritize that and move that forward for us in the future? I'm going to start with uh, Jay on this one, please. That's good. It'll help me run with the question. <laughs> so uh, you're electing a federal representative here, and your federal representative is arguably your most important advocate in the land the policy of managing these vast federal lands because of so many because so many of them are uh, are governed by federal policy. So uh, in an area like ours, obviously this is a critical role. I want to highlight though what we're losing in Congressman Cook because he has been a staunch advocate for changes in land use policy that benefits our districts and our communities. And uh, it's, it's in the last couple of years, it's been amazing what he has been able to accomplish there. Uh, and whoever re uh, replaces him is going to have big shoes to fill because everything in Washington is based on seniority. So it's taken Congressman Cook a few years of representing the area to get enough seniority to be able to walk in and do something like establish a new monument. So uh, I don't want to anyone to overlook the monumental challenge that is going to face any of us that are going to look to, sh to fill those shoes. Uh, also, I want to talk for a second about the issue of uh, forestry and wildfire preparation because this is something that is absolutely critical to our entire con congressional district but particularly for the community of Mammoth. And I understand it very well representing, as I do, the San Bernardino Mountain communities. 
because we're facing exactly the same challenges. Uh, as climate change accelerates, we are going to see an increasing frequency of fires, an increasing duration of fires, and increasing severity of fires. And they are going to, and I'm not overstating this, they are going to threaten our ability to live in a beautiful place like this and to continue to have a community that's surrounded by national forest. Okay, it is absolutely, absolutely critical that we get our arms around the problem of forest management, that we harden our infrastructure, and that we prepare for those things. Because if we don't, the casualty industry, in other words, property insurance, is going to solve that problem for us. And they're going to solve it in a way that's going to destroy all of our communities. In other words, fire insurance is going to be so expensive because of the risk that these insurance companies are going to take that none of us are going to be able to afford it and our mountain communities are going to die. So it is critical that we call attention to this issue at the federal level. Critical. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> Tim, what do you got for us? So, in terms of the impact locally here, I, I'm going to look at it from a slightly different viewpoint. Surprise, surprise. Um, my wife and I are staying out at uh, Convict Lake, which is in Mono County. Um, we discovered it on our way to an education conference when I was an assemblyman and wound up enjoying a little fishing and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the August sun and just thought it was such a magical place. And, uh, and, and it's really strange that I happen to become friends with one of the owners. And he has shared with me the challenges of operating a business on um, what is federal land. And for instance, you would think if, if the operator of that business wants to invest money in making it safer for everyone, especially vis-a-vis -vis the forest fire risk, the U.S. Forest Service would bend over backwards. Or the representative, you know, who is in Congress would be able to get something done. And despite his pleas, despite his, his begging for help, despite his negotiating, um, it's taken two years and they will not give him a permit just to replace a transformer. And it's a transformer that needs to be replaced. And you know a lot of fires are sparked by faulty transformers. So there's some work that needs to be done that has nothing to do with the funding. Because I don't think any freshman representative, which all of us would be in Congress because none of us has been there, um, would be able to really control how much federal funding is actually going to these agencies. Um, but we can control the, the impact locally for an actual business owner who is operating a business, who is employing people, who is paying tax in this community, who is part of the solution. And I think that's the crucial role. And, and that's where it becomes more about accessibility and, and having a true representative who will go pick a fight for you. Because that's ultimately the job that each of us is interviewing you for. In order to do, to do that, you've got to get to know some of the people, and, and, and that's something I really enjoy doing and would love to do for you. Very good, Tim. Thank you. Chris, please. So, this is personal to those of us who live in mountain communities, that we need to make sure that we keep our community safe. And I was privileged to be able to attend the fire town hall last summer, um, that was put on by Bob and Stacy Corliss, and it was, I was so heartened and thrilled to see the Sheriff's Department, our county supervisors, BLM representatives, Forest Service representatives, all come together and talk about the challenge and risk that we face from the fact that we have federal lands that frankly just haven't received the funding that we need to take care of them at the most basic level for far too long. But what made me so happy and heartened was the plans and the work and the uh, you know know-how of our local leaders to bring to bear state funding that was available to start to clean up you know the Twin Lakes area. So our greatest fire risk is being addressed right now. Made me understand the job of the federal representative 
is to go to Washington and make sure that you are advocating for and obtaining the support to do the work that your local representatives already have figured out. I want to just mention that I'm really proud to have received the endorsement of the League of Conservation Voters and the Sierra Club because I think it's going to take all of us all around this country in all our different communities working together to articulate the challenges that we face if we don't manage our federal lands better. And look, I love my children, but I only had them because I want grandchildren. <laughs> and I want my grandchildren to hike the John Muir Trail, which my family and I did for a big birthday that we had, that I had, that I won't say the number. <laughs> um, but that's what we owe future generations, and we need to get on this immediately. And that's what I will do. But the amazing thing is that we need to be practical about it. So a practical way to talk about funding federal lands is to say, we have a fire risk. And oh, by the way, our very clever local government is saying to the city of Los Angeles, you need to help us manage our fire risk. Because if we have a catastrophe in the Twin Lakes Basin, your water supply is affected. Those are the kinds of smart things that we should be doing to make sure that we are creating incentives for people to take care of our lands that also you know, makes urban areas understand that we are one planet, country, and state, and when we try to just do things piecemeal, we end up with downstream consequences that take much longer to fix than if we had just been practical from the beginning. Thanks so much. Well done. I, I appreciate your comments about incentives, but sometimes you got to pick a fight. Housing is a tremendous problem. Let's go macro, let's go macro to micro. Let's go micro to macro. Talk about the housing impact, the crisis we have. How do you help us solve it here in our in our region, in our state, and then go macro nationally? What the hell are we going to do? It's out of control. My kids can't afford a house. Help me with that one. Let's start with Tim. Kick us off. Uh, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. You keep saying that every time you say <laughs> that, dude. You want votes or not? <laughs> I do, but I'm not going to compromise my There you go, brother. <laughs> you need more private property if you want more housing here. And then that will make it more competitive. It's, it's a zero-sum game. We know this. That's economics. Um, but at the same time, maybe you don't want more private property because you don't want what that will bring. Uh, so there are consequences to whatever decisions that we make. And, and look. It is not our job here as your representative to tell you how to live. It's our job to represent you to the best of our ability and um, solving the national housing crisis, um, solving the housing crisis here. I laid out a couple of pragmatic ideas earlier, but um, we, we need to build more. And, Yet, when you try to build more, it depends on which community they run into um, people that don't want housing built. So, you know, this is not something that has a one-size-fits-all in any regard. Um, and I wouldn't even pretend that I had a, a solution to the national housing crisis. But I can tell you, in California, a big part of the housing crisis is tied to how high the cost of living is. And the cost of living is high artificially because of the high cost of our government. Our taxes are ridiculously out of control. And our government will not stop spending. I mean, they're bragging in the newspapers about how much they spent in all these programs that they funded. And that sounds great on its surface. But if you lock in that spending, and then down the road, you don't have the revenue that you had today. We're going to be back in the same situation we were in when I was first elected. When I walked into the California State Assembly under uh, Governor uh, Jerry Brown, because uh, Schwarzenegger was just outgoing, we had a $30 billion budget deficit. $30 billion. And the way that they fix that is they raise taxes on everybody. So now, you know, everything costs more. So I think we need to look at it getting rid of some levels of government 
We need to be looking at taking regulations out so that we can actually do the things we need to do. And, you know, you, whatever we choose to do, there will be consequences. There is no magic bullet in terms of this solution. Very good. Thanks, Tim. All righty, Chris. Thanks. The housing crisis in this country is one of the biggest, and like Tim, I will not pretend to be able to solve at the national level. We know that we need 3.5 million housing units in California as soon as possible. And the challenges throughout our district are diverse in terms of need, but ultimately, I think that when you go to local communities, we understand our needs at a better level than when you try to do things top down. So in a bottom up way, talk to communities, understand what their needs are, and make sure that we are working with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, that we are working to make sure we bring community development block grants to communities where there are specific housing needs, that we make sure that we create ways for people to get the kinds of loans that will allow them to get into housing stock, but we also have to rethink what kind of housing stock we are creating in this country because we keep spreading out and I think even in our rural communities we need to think about ways where density makes sense that we are being practical about it. And that me that actually applies from Victorville to to all the way up here to you know, we've even had a situation in Levining where there's talk of building very large um, housing opportunity for people who work in the tourism business and that's controversial but at least the conversation is happening and that's where coming together and meeting the needs of a community and bringing to bear the funding that will create that opportunity allowing it to happen is how we're going to solve this so thank you thank you Jay, you need a reminder what the question is? No, thank you. All right, yeah. uh, I'm actually going to disagree with my colleagues here. Uh, the problem is actually very simple. The solutions are not simple, but the problem is simple. Uh, ask any economist why housing is so expensive here in California, and they will tell you it's a problem of supply and demand. When supply is constrained, the demand is high, pricing goes up. So there are only two solutions. You can have fewer people. We don't want to do that. You can have a greater supply of housing. That's what we need to do. That's the only thing that's going to solve the problem. So we need to focus on why aren't we building more housing in California? And when we do get that housing built, why the heck is it so expensive? And that is a complicated problem, but it has its roots in the policies of our federal and our state governments. And I'll give you a couple of concrete examples from my time in the legislature that illustrate this point. Do you realize that building a house I'm sure here in Inyo and Mono counties, uh, cost the better part of $100,000 before you even put a shovel in the ground. Before you even buy the property, cost you the better part of $100,000 just to get through all the permitting requirements, satisfy all of the government mandates. So that, that's something that we need to take a look at. Because the local government agencies that depend on those things like development impact fees and water fees, meter fees, all the things that drive up those costs, the reason they're doing that is because the state and the federal governments are starving them of money. And that's the only source of revenue that they have to be able to provide the vital services that they do. So if you look at what's happened over the past 30 years, 30 years ago we had a couple of stable sources of revenue, property tax, sales tax, income tax. The only growing source of revenue there is income tax. It now comprises over 70% of California state budget, and all of it goes to Sacramento and Washington, D.C., and none of it goes to our local agencies. So we need to, uh, to accept more of a responsibility to provide the services that those things do, that those agencies do with that money. And then we need to get serious about the requirements that we're putting on new housing. Uh, there was a rule enacted last year that says that every new house in California has to have solar panels. And I'm a fan of solar panels. I have them on my house. I have them on my business. I think that, that uh, that's very supportable to have solar panels on your house. But to force solar panels on new construction adds, according to legislative analysts, $30,000 to the cost of building a home. That's crazy. We have utilities that can build utilities, industrial scale solar, that provide that energy cheaper than forcing people to put them on their homes. So. Uh, and I can give you a litany of things. There's a bill that I fought against. It affects our district. 
it passed a couple of years ago. I was able to stop it two years in a row. The third year, unfortunately, it passed. It requires every single house to either be on municipal water system or to have a well. You cannot rely on hauled water, which for a lot of my constituents, that's the cheapest way of doing it. You know, which I think is crazy because most of my district is located in a place where at least you'd have to drill a well, and wells can cost upwards of $50,000 to get down to where the water is. Okay, so it's those kinds of government mandates that we need to get our arms around to solve this homeless problem and get more supply out there. Thank you, Jay. Well done. Let's give him a nice round of applause. <laughs> okay, we're going to begin to bring closure. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a closing comment. But before we get there, let's give the organizing committee a nice round of applause for bringing us together today. All right, we're going to go Chris, Jay, and Tim. You're the new kid on the block. Why you? Why here? Why now? Why should we vote for you? Chris, kick us off. We'll go to Jay and then Tim. Three minutes. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I never expected to be standing here before you, but there are certain times in your life where you feel compelled to stand up and make your voice heard on behalf of people who might need their voices heard, who might not otherwise get their voices heard. And I am running to be your representative because I feel like at this time in history, a mom who has raised a family helped her aging parents, and worked full time all at the same time, understands the needs of our working families. I want to be able to go to Washington and be that voice for all of the people of our district. And I also want to make sure that I am listening and understanding what everybody in our district needs and wants. So as I already mentioned, I would be very honored to be your representative I would show up, I would have town halls, I would listen to your concerns, I would have the kind of staff that Jay is so proud to have. I work in a collaborative manner, I've got an incredible team already that is here trying to meet the needs of the people of our district while we're running to be your representative. So I just am so grateful to you, so delighted to be here in Mammoth, seeing all of you participating in our democracy, because it's only together with people who we agree with and those who we might agree with on the principle or the fundamental challenge that we're trying to address, but we only disagree on how we want to get there, that it is time for us to come together and make sure that we're creating the kind of future for our working families that we all dream of and we all agree all Americans deserve. I hope you will consider voting for me on March 3rd in the primary and again on November 3rd. And I'm incredibly grateful that you've been here participating today and I really want to thank all the organizers. Mammoth Voices is a treasure that I wish we had in every town in the district. Thank you. Well done, Chris. Hey, hey, please. I, this is my close. I'm going to stand to the vote. <laughs> um, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's, and I apologize for my appearance. I had to come straight from Sacramento. i got to go straight back when we're done because I have an event tonight. But uh, it, it is really, really important, the civic engagement that you've shown here. And I wish that I had 750,000 constituents just like you that were willing to come to a forum. Because the challenge of getting elected, as, as anyone who's run a campaign knows, and as all of us sitting at this table know, is just getting people to know that you exist. Because most people don't take the time, as you have done, to come to a forum to educate themselves on the issues. It's really important, so thank you very much. Uh, I also want to say to my uh, colleagues up here, a great job, that you don't know how hard it is to sit at a table like this and to answer questions like this. And I'll tell you, most candidates, particularly new candidates would just read a statement when they had the quick questions in advance. Uh, this has been a really, really engaging discussion. I think you, the, some really interesting viewpoints, and uh, we've got three people that, that has really done a great job here, so you know, good job to both of you. Um, I am passionate about representing you in Congress, and, and I think I could say that with authority because I've been passionate about representing two-thirds of the Congressional District in the State Assembly for the last six years. I'll tell you this, it is the hardest job I have ever had in my life. And I've had some hard ones, but this one is the hardest job ever because no one gives you a manual when you get elected on what it means to be an effective representative. 
right? You have to figure it out on your own. And what you find out very quickly is that if you make a list of all of the different things that you could spend your time doing as a representative, you will quickly run out of time. You couldn't do a tenth of what's possible even if you work 24-7. So we all have to prioritize. We all have to figure out what are our values, what are our principles, what's important about being a representative, what do we think are the important parts of the job, and we do those things. And if you want to know what kind of a congressional representative I would be, just look at how I have managed being an assembly representative for the last six years. Uh, I'm very thankful to have the endorsement of outgoing representative Congressman Cook. Uh, I have the endorsement of all 13 mayors of all 13 cities in the congressional district, including here in Mammoth. Uh, I, I I'm really, really grateful for that because I think it demonstrates that if local government is willing to say, yes, Jay O'Nolte has done a great job representing us in the legislature, he'd do a good job in Congress, uh, that means a lot to me to have them say that. Uh, I have the, the endorsement of the Inyo County Sheriff, the uh, San Bernardino County Sheriff, over 150,000 law enforcement officers throughout California have endorsed me because of my strong stances on public safety. But uh, uh, in particular, I'm passionate about being your voice in Congress. And let me close by saying, uh, I, I love your mission statement at Mammoth Voices. I love it. What has happened to us lately that, that there's no political discourse that's civil anymore? So I love the fact that we can sit down and have a discussion where it's about, uh, it's about principles, it's about policy, and it's not about personality. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here today, and I would be really honored if you consider voting for me in the primary. Thank you, Jay. Bring us on, Tim. You know, I am uh, honored to be here. I'm grateful for the forum and the great questions and, um, and for the great attendance. You guys deserve a round of applause. Um, and and, and uh, I'll echo what Jay said. <clears throat> Jay and I don't often agree, but... Um, I, I'm honored to be on this panel with you guys, and I think, um, I think we have put forth some good candidates who have it in their hearts to be a good representative. One of the questions that you guys asked, and it was the one that scared me the most, you didn't ask, which is, what is your leadership style? Right? If, we, if we had more time, we would have gotten there. Well, I'm going to answer it. Um, I, I've been sitting here thinking, is it... I, I was thinking it's 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 maybe my leadership style could be described as pit bull because you know when I go after something I grab onto it and I never stop I'm very dogged but then I thought no that's a little too aggressive um, so I so I settled on bully pulpit because that's what I've done I've used the bully pulpit I'll give you an example when we had a U.S. Marine who was stuck in a Mexican jail, who was suffering PTSD, who had put his life on the line for every one of us. He had served two tours, he had been blown up by an IED, he made a U-turn at the border and, and went the wrong way, and wound up for over 200 days being in this jail cell where he was beaten up, where he attempted suicide, where Various members of uh, the press were telling his story, but nobody in the government would do anything about it. And he was stuck there. Here's a guy that served our country. This is a veteran. You know, you, you hear all this talk about what we're going to do for people. Well, when, you're in a, when you hold a seat, that bully pulpit exists there for you to use it. So I was a lame duck. I had run for governor. I was a lame duck assemblyman. It's August of 2014. I got invited to a lunch with Jerry Brown and Governor Jerry Brown and the, and the Mexican president. So I decided to hold a protest. I wrote the governor a letter. I went on national television. I got 500 people in the streets. And two things were accomplished that day. Number one, we, we forced the governor and the Mexican president, who had the power to release our Marine, to acknowledge his existence. And the talks that had broken down between U.S. Marine Sergeant Andrew Tamarisi's attorney and the Mexican government were restarted that morning. And I was informed of that by Congressman Duncan Hunter, who had been one of the only ones fighting on this issue. The bottom line is, one man, one voice can make a difference. And I want to be yours. Well Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.
Kathleen, you are magnificent with timing. We are a minute ahead of ourselves. <laughs> We're going to go around the room round robin to see if we have any questions. We'll ask you to raise your hand, stand tall, and ask your question to 